Good morning everyone. My name is Judy Dransfield and I have the privilege of continuing the series that Pastor Richard started last week. Um, the series is called When the Devil Knocks and Pastor Richard finished on When We Hit Rock Bottom. But remember, Jesus is our rock at the bottom. Myself, I'm a wife, a mother, stepmom, a nana, a daughter, a sister, a counsellor, but I always put Christian in front. And I need you to know that I've used some stories here from clients that I've seen, but I have their permission to do so. So I'd like to pray before we start. Heavenly Father, I just pray that it's your words that come forth today, that you open hearts and minds to hear what you want to say to people. And I just pray, Lord, that this be of help to many people out there. And I pray that in your holy name. Amen. Well, when we think about the enemy, what do we think about? And I think for me, I've realised that there's three main areas that he wants to attack. The first, of course, is our relationship with God. And the second is our relationship with each other. And the third is whatever God's purpose is for our life to stop us fulfilling that. And I'll refer back to these as we go through this. So quite often I'm asked the question, is the enemy real? Well, of course he's real. He's right through the Bible. I mean, we start off in Matthew um, chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, when um, Satan takes Jesus out into the wilderness and tempts him. And what he's trying to do is divert him from his reason for being on this earth, and that was his journey to the cross and beyond. So when we have an enemy, one of the first things we need to do is know our enemy. And in this case, our enemy's goal is destruction. And he does this by deception. If we look back in the Bible, um, we could see that he was once a holy angel, but he wanted to take over from God and all his power. So God sent him from heaven along with the angels that were supporting him, about a third of the angels. So he's now God's enemy. He opposes God, his purposes and his people with every bit of his considerable strength. In John 8.44, it says, You are from the Father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and had nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Whenever I have come across the enemy, he's always whispered in my ear. And little things like, who do you think you are? You're not able to do that. Get over yourself. So he works by planting little seeds of doubt, of, often in the form of, of questions in our minds. So he messes with our mindset and our way of thinking. So if we go back to the first thing he wanted to destroy, and that's our relationship with God. We need to go right back to Genesis, and we see that there in, was the temptation of Eve. And so Satan asked Eve, did God really say? So he twists God's words and his meaning. And then following that, Adam blamed Eve, that's Genesis 3, 9 to 12. And this is another strategy that the enemy uses. He divides and rules. And what he did was he tried to reorientate their lives, turning away from their focus of obedience to God towards obedience to themselves. Please understand the strategy, it's really powerful. And the way he operated then, he still operates that way now. He sows seeds to attack those areas that I mentioned. And if we're not careful, those seeds can take root and we can breathe life into them. So they lead on to faulty thinking and they can cripple our lives. 1 Peter 5.8 and also in Job 
chapters 1 and 2, so 1, 6 and 2, 1, he's described as a roaring lion that prowls around looking for someone to devour. He's a deceiver and the father of lies, and he also accuses us. One of the things that I've come across as a counsellor is a lot of clients who come to me who as children and sometimes as adults, they've been abused in many ways. They come out of that believing that it was their fault, that they're full of blame and shame, and quite often they're angry with God. And they say things like, if, I, if only they knew what I was really like, I'm such a bad person. And I'll say, why are you a bad person? And they'll say, because of the bad things I've done. And my answer usually is, mm -hmm, I see. So as a child, you were in a position of being able to not only make a decision about what happened to you, but also to make sure that it did happen. Is that correct? And quite often they stop and think, well, no, I was a child. I had no control over that. But the outcomes that happens from these sorts of events is that people become suspicious and that gives Satan such fertile ground and there's a gap that has to be crossed to the relationship with, with our Father in heaven. So what the enemy is doing is he's attacking that relationship first, our one with God, and if we take heart, all we need is the cross to cross that gap. Another way that um, Satan can come in and distract us is we get lethargic about going to church, reading our Bible or spending time with God. I have to say that I'm guilty of that too. That's happened to me. But, you know, it reminds me of when I see those pictures of lions stalking their prey. What do they do? They pick on the weakest one and they separate them out from the herd and then they attack and I'm sure that's what Satan does so just really protect yourself you know you can it's a bit like exercising if you don't exercise you don't wonder why you haven't got a, a healthy body and you're not healthy but if you do exercise that's what happens we need to exercise our minds as well we know from the Bible especially in Revelation, that the enemy is defeated in the end times. But knowing that is one thing. We also have to be aware that he's a constant threat to us and he wants to sever our relationship with God. And the next thing he wants to do is sever our relationship with others. And again, there's a divide and rule. And quite often I've had clients that have come to me and said, I, I don't go out, I don't mix with people. And I say, why is that? Oh, I just think I'm, a, I'm an imposter. You know, um, if they really knew what I was like, they wouldn't want to be friends with me. And I think what we do is, based on our own experience, we start to interpret what we think people are thinking about us. Don't fall into that trap. Be strong, check it out. The Bible here tells us, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. That's Psalm 133.1. And again in Colossians 3.14-15. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Well, I don't know about you, but last week I heard a very wise preacher and he said the enemy is coming against you. You can't avoid him, but you have the opportunity to resist and overcome. We can build a storm-proof life, but not a storm-free life. The ones who stand in the storms are the ones who will do what our Lord says. And man, I want to be one of those that stands in the storms. The next and last area that, that I think the enemy wants to um, detract us from and take us away from is fulfilling God's purpose for us. 
when I first became a Christian, um, and not long after that, I trained to become a counsellor. My placement was in Mount Eden Prison. And I remained there for another three years as the counsellor. In the process of that, I met a lady who had a partner in prison and they were just not getting on and he was very distressed. I managed to arrange to bring her in so I could see them both together. As time went by, I formed quite a good relationship with this woman and she told me one day, I want to do what you do. And I said to her, well, you need to go and get some training. So I sent her off to the institution where I'd begun my training and I got a call from the director of the course to say, who is this woman? She'd come from being a gang woman, um, she had tattoos, she looked like a little bit scary really but inside of her was this beautiful heart and so she um, started to train she faced huge obstacles and she now works as a counsellor doing amazing work in a different part of the country now did the enemy want that no and he did all he could to derail her. But she had the courage to get up and make something new of her life. And she now impacts many, many people. And she speaks from her experience from being in the gangs and having a partner who was a gang member and what that's like. So people relate to her and she's able to bring incredible healing. So... And the strange thing was, you know, when I was water baptised, I was in my 30s, and there were two uh, verses that were given to me. Uh, one was, um, let me have a look, hang on, Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear not evil, for you are with me. And man, have I relied on that verse over and over again. And the second verse was, have I Isaiah 61 1 the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound or well, when I worked in Mount Eden I couldn't open up the prison but I could open up the minds and spirits of the people who were captive there and I was reminded of that verse being prophesied over me by my husband when I first went into the prison because I never ever thought that would apply to me. So I think you need to find out what your purposes are. You know, Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that's what we need. And when we are heading down our purpose, we're then able to help others to give them plans for hope and a future. If you're not sure what God's purpose is in your life, go and ask someone. Get prayer. Search God and say, what do you want for me? And then get confirmation from people that are wise. And remember all the time that the enemy don't, won't want you to succeed. So, what do we do when the devil knocks? Don't be frightened. Remember that the Holy Spirit is more powerful than the enemy and his followers. If you're a follower of Jesus, you become one with him by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, the enemy has no power over you, except that which you allow him to have. So be on guard. You know, and I have to tell you that this, the Bible, it's our greatest spiritual weapon. It it's gives us our plan for, for warfare. I would suggest that you start living in this, you talk in this, and you walk in the word of God. Some of my favorite scriptures are Romans 8.28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, so we need to love God 
and we have to know what his purpose is. And I love 1 John 4.4. 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. That's the enemy. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. And then I always take courage from this verse, Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So no matter where you are, God is there. And then this is a great one for spiritual warfare. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon for forged against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. No weapon forged against you shall prevail. Take that to heart. It's really, really helpful. Things that I do is I put on the armour of God daily. So when I wake up, I clothe myself. If you want to know what that is, you look at Ephesians 6, 11 to 18. But you will note that all of the armour, except for one, the last one, are defensive. Your helmet of salvation and your breastplate of righteousness, that's a defensive weapon. But the last one, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, this is our weapon of attack. This is such a powerful weapon and it belongs to all of us. Just sitting there waiting for us to delve into that and use it. So take encouragement that the enemy and his demons can be overcome. In Luke 10, 17 to 18, it says, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And know that temptations will come. Be prepared. Surround yourself with and be accountable to good Christian people that are able to help you in any areas you may have to face. Find people that are non-judgmental, that love you unconditionally, to the point where they're prepared to speak into your life when correction is needed. Remember that the enemy can appear as an angel of light, but he is in fact the angel of darkness. Paul refers to the enemy in 2 Corinthians 11.14 as one who masquerades as an angel of light. He masquerades. He's not. He's just pretending. Don't forget he's clever. And don't forget also that we're dealing with an enemy within and without. In our minds, this is the battleground I've found. Don't forget also that we're not puppets on a string. He can't influence us unless we give him the opportunity. We don't have to submit to him. We can stand strong. And comfort for me comes from knowing my standing in Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in my life. And that can apply to you as well. And remember, Satan's defeat was foretold from the beginning. We start in Genesis and we end in Revelation and he is defeated. So, Stay prepared for spiritual battle. This is our battle plan. Honour it and use it as such. And the quickest way to lose a battle is not even realise you're in one. We are in one. There's a slide that will come up and I would like you to look at um, what it says. We have a choice here. We can go down the steps. So... Lie number one, you're supposed to have it all together. Lie number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours. Lie number three, you are not enough. Lie number four, you are not worthy. Gosh, I've heard that so often. Lie number five, no one cares about you. Lie number six, you're not special. Next step, don't believe the lies. Rise above them, choose to move forward, and at the door at the bottom it says, let the truth be told. So turn around and start making the choice to go up the steps. You're special, you're beautiful, you're worthy, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you are so valuable, you're kind, you're brilliant, you're lovable, you're capable, you matter and that's the truth 
as we come to the end here, there may be things that have tapped into events and wounds from your own lives. Can I please suggest you go and see your connect group leader if you need some help and they will either be able to help you or they'll refer you on to someone else who will. Don't let the enemy win and sit in condemnation. That doesn't come from God. I'd now like to pray for everybody. Dear Lord, people who pray for miracles usually don't get miracles. Any more than children who pray for bicycles, good grades or good boyfriends get them as a result of praying. The people who pray for courage, for strength to bear the unbearable, for the grace to remember what they have left instead of what they have lost, very often find their prayer answered. Therefore, Lord, I pray for everybody here to you. God, for strength, determination and willpower to do instead of just to pray, to become instead of merely to wish.